This is the third vodcast for uh, uh, cosmology and telescopes. Uh, this is unit four. And this one's specifically going to look at uh, a little bit left over from telescopes and also uh, two types of astronomy that we can do. When we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you can divide it up from radio all the way into gamma. And each branch of that electromagnetic spectrum studies its own, uh, own parts of the universe. So we're going to look at the visible and the radio uh, stuff today. Uh, first, let's quickly wrap up some of the stuff that we didn't do with uh, telescopes. Again, we mentioned last time that all telescopes, the main goal is to bring as much light to focus so that we can see very, very faint objects. All right. So, for example, a small telescope looking at this, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, you can see the central part. Uh, it's very bright. Uh, but in a larger telescope, you see that central part, but you can also begin to see these outer layers of concentric rings of gas and dust and stars, which you really can't. You can make out some dust lanes in here. Bigger telescopes collect more light. We covered that. There is also a second advantage to having bigger telescopes, and that is resolving power. All right. The more resolving power, or in other words, the more detail that you have, <clears throat> uh, let me give you an example. Small telescopes, again, looking at the Andromeda galaxy, it would be dimmer, but also, even under intense magnification and under perfect seeing, you really wouldn't get a sharp image. You'd have something a little blurry like this, because there is a theoretical limit on how much magnification you can undergo and still get a sharp image. The larger the telescope, though, you start to resolve more and more detail until you get to the really big telescopes where you can make out those very, very fine details. So bigger is always better for astronomy. More light and sharper images. Now, we also mentioned that uh, our atmosphere is really bad for uh, doing astronomy, especially here in Indiana. As you guys were doing that forecast for the, uh, uh, the week, you saw that there are two kind of decent nights here in Indiana. And really, you probably only get one where you can see the stars this week. But our atmosphere, through cloudiness, through atmospheric turbulence, through light pollution, affects how we see the night sky. And we could build telescopes on top of mountains, far away from light pollution, up above as much atmosphere as we possibly can. Or if you really uh, had a lot of money, you could build them in space. But there is another way around it known as adaptive optics. All right. Let me show you a little video on what adaptive op optics is. A laser pierces the night sky. It projects an artificial star into the atmosphere 90 kilometers above our heads. Wavefront sensors measure how the star's image is distorted by the atmospheric turbulence. Then, fast computers tell a flexible mirror of how it has to deform itself in order to correct the distortion, in effect untwinkling the stars. This is called adaptive optics and it's the big magic trick of present-day astronomy. Without it, our view of the universe would look blurred by the atmosphere. But with it, our images are razor sharp. So with the adaptive optics, basically it's taking the twinkling out of the starlight because it's actually reshaping that mirror. And it can do that using uh, stars or an actual um, a laser as a fake guide star. So let me show you a, uh, an image that is without adaptive optics first. All right. So we can see that there's a bright central region here. It's kind of fuzzy, though. And you also got this other part kind of stretching out here. It's hard to make out. And again, without adaptive optics, what you really would be seeing here with the turbulence in our atmosphere is that star or object, whatever we're looking at, appears to move around and shimmy and shake and distort. With adaptive optics, though, taking that mirror and removing that wobble, this is actually what we can see. We can start to resolve a very, very tight central region. This very thin blue jet that's coming out of it. We'll look at that later. The other way around this is known as interferometry. All right, and I've also got a little video here for this. The other piece of optical wizardry is known as interferometry. The idea is to take the light from two separate telescopes 
and to bring it together in a single point, while preserving the relative shifts between the light waves. If it is done precisely enough, the result is that the two telescopes act as if they were part of a single colossal mirror as large as the distance between them. In effect, interferometry gives your telescope eagle-like vision. It allows smaller telescopes to reveal a level of detail that would otherwise only be visible with a much larger telescope. The twin Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea regularly team up as an interferometer. In the case of the VLT, all four telescopes can work together. In addition, several smaller auxiliary telescopes can also join the ranks in order to sharpen up the view even more. Now we're going to look at the two branches of astronomy that we can do here on the surface. First, uh, visible astronomy is what we've always had. We start out with Galileo looking through his telescope, looking at objects, and you can look at things like uh, stars. Uh, visible astronomy studies the stars. It's the Pleiades star cluster in Taurus. We can look at galaxies, which are just collections of stars and gas and dust. We can look at things like planets. All right. Planets that reflect uh, that light, that don't actually admit it, but reflect it. So visible astronomy is good for looking at those objects, but uh, here is another picture that I want you to notice. This is the Milky Way galaxy. This is our galaxy viewed from the inside, and this is the central bulge of the, uh, the, the Milky Way. And you can see there's some nebula, there's a lot of stars, but there's also this black stuff. If you zoom in on that black stuff, what it is is a bunch of gas and dust that is actually blocking uh, the light of stars that are behind it. Visible light does not go through this gas and dust. All right. It gets scattered and absorbed. Radio telescopes are very good in astronomy because they do not go th uh, get absorbed by this gas and dust. All right. It can go right through our atmosphere, so we can do it here on the Earth, and it goes right through all that gas and dust so that we can see this. Uh, it's not as pretty of a picture, but we can make out that central bulge and other things, and that uh, light just goes right on through. Uh, some of the main objects uh, that we can study, we can actually zoom in a little bit more uh, to the center of the Milky Way and see this spiraling effect. All right, this is where we get that, uh, we can see and study that central massive black hole we can see gas and dust whirling in and around it. We can actually see old supernova of stars that got too close and blew themselves to pieces. But there are a lot of objects out there that emit very little, if any, uh, visible light, but are very, very strong in uh, the radio waves. Uh, for example, we have... Uh, the interstellar gas and dust that you kind of saw that's floating around out there in the center of the Milky Way. Uh, we can actually look at something known as the cosmic background radiation. Uh, we'll look at this a little bit later on. This is basically a picture of the night sky in microwave. Uh, and to not get too into it, it's actually a picture of the uh, universe when it was very, very young. And we can also look at things like uh, something known as an active galaxy, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and planets. But to do that, you need a really big telescope. All right, it kind of looks like a satellite dish. And if you're a Bond fan, you will recognize this from one of the uh, James Bond movies, GoldenEye. This is known as the Arecibo Radio Telescope. It's the largest telescope in the world, where the other telescopes that I showed you yesterday with visible. We're about 10 meters wide. This is 300 meters wide. All right. Three football fields across. And you need that because there's not a lot of radio light out there. All right. it's, they're just dim. So to get a lot of light, you need a big telescope. Uh, so here's, you can study planets also uh, in radio. This is what Venus looks like in a visible light. We can't really see under its clouds. But with radio, it goes right on through that gas and dust, and we can actually see surface features. Now, this is a false color image, but we can zoom in on some of these and start to see the lava plains and volcanoes and all kinds of impact craters that are on its surface. 
This is uh, something that you probably might recognize from an activity you did uh, yesterday in class or maybe today in class. It's Centaurus A. It's a, a galaxy in Centaurus. And this is invisible light, and you can see all that gas and dust in here. Uh, very, very pretty. When we look at it in radio, though, we get something very odd. We get a complete reversal where there's something that doesn't look like it's there in the visible, but in radio is very strong, very strong in the center of that galaxy. And then you've got these lobes and jets shooting out the other way so that when you combine this uh, radio with some false color images, we get to see something like this. Uh, again, when comparing those radio versus visible, this is the visible without adaptive optics. This is with adaptive optics. But radio all right, is really strong. Right? You can see that gas jet protrude even farther out. You can see that it actually spreads out here. There's some uh, going the other way. And we can zoom even further in since radio waves uh, penetrate all that gas and dust and use very large telescopes. We can get very detailed images. Now, I did mention one other thing that we'll end up with. Active galaxies. What the heck are these things? It does look like a galaxy with these jets coming out. And you should also remember that in the center of every galaxy that we can see, we suspect that there is a super massive black hole. And as that stuff falls into the black hole, we can see uh, the, the black holes feeding. And sometimes a little bit of this stuff gets thrown out. All right. That uh, black hole that's feeding is the active galaxy. It, you are seeing a supermassive black hole feeding on the gas and dust surrounding it. As it falls in, some of it does get thrown out at near the speed of light, traveling for thousands, if not millions, of light years out. So active galaxies, uh, nuclei, are just these uh, supermassive black holes that are feeding that we see uh, in very distant and very young galaxies. So tomorrow, uh, we will pick up again uh, in class with uh, another activity or something. You do have a vodcast uh, quiz that goes along with this on Edmodo, so be sure to do that.